All right. Um, I just got something real quick that I've been messing around with. Um, it's kind of Angular 101-ish, so forgive me. But uh, one thing I really like about Angular is that there are tons of extensibility points. Um, I know when I said it on G+, I said global layer handling and response interceptors, and that's kind of what I'm going to show you. But the, the overall uh, concept is providers and uh, decorators. Um, I'm going to go through this kind of quick because it's kind of Angular 101. But uh, anytime you create a service, a factory, a value, anything like that, what you're actually creating is a provider. Uh, actually, the only thing that Angular understands is provider. Um, the service, factory, and value are just kind of syntactic sugar for creating a value. This right here is actually copied right out of the Angular source code. So you can see when you create a service, all you're doing is creating a provider. When you create a factory, you're creating a provider. Value, you're creating a provider. What a provider is it takes the service that whatever object you create, wraps it in another function that has a dollar get uh, function on it. So. Uh, at config time, you have access to the provider, and then uh, at runtime, the first time you ask for a uh, something to be injected, it runs git, which returns whatever is, is in here, and that's what you're using for the rest of your app. Okay, more or less. And I made kind of a a simple. Uh, Thing down here so you can see how it works so if you wanted to make your own configurable uh, service you just do it like this uh, you will pass in the name you want and then this is your provider function and then you have to provide it this git so at config time when you say app.config in this case I say example.provider Angular automatically tax provider onto the end of any service or anything like that uh, you use. I'm getting some blank looks. Is there any questions? All right. Uh, <coughs> so Angular automatically puts that provider on the end of any service name that you uh, create. Like in this case, example. We're making example provider. And it will inject that provider. So uh, at this point, you have access to this function right here. In this function, I, I put something said set config text. And all I'm doing is setting the text. So at config time, you can configure your services. And luckily, uh, Angular gave us some config options for the HTTP service. I made like a little demo app that's incredibly simple. I've, it's run on web API. All I do is when I load up, I go and I grab these values, and you can select one, and it puts it down here. It's not doing anything, anything real cool. But as you can see, if you look down in my uh, debug window down here, I'm logging out. Uh, the font, uh, yeah. Command plus. Okay. Better? Okay. <laughs> you can see every time I'm making a request, I'm logging out down here that it started and it's completed. So I'll show you how I did that. Um. I remember. Okay. Probably want this bigger too, don't you? Okay. So I have a little Angular app and it's uh, defined up here in app.js. But um, during my config, I. Oh, I'm in the wrong demo. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. This is better. That's for the next thing I'm going to show you. But uh, during app.config, 
I asked for a provider, inject provider and the HTTP provider. It's actually HTTP service. Um, Angular puts provider on it. And uh, I'm creating an HTTP interceptor. Uh, basically, all that this is is uh, I could have put this function up here. I just tried to make it a little bit more uh, easier to push. So my HTTP interceptor, all this is, is if you look down here, the provider has a array of interceptors on it. So you can make as many of these as you want, push them on there. It'll go through them all one by one. I'm pushing this HTTP interceptor that I made right here. I created a factory, made the interceptor, and I'm pushing it on to the interceptor array. My interceptor looks like this. It just takes a queue library, and you have four uh, properties you can put on any interceptor object. You can request, request error, response, and response error. So uh, you can see when I make a request, I'm just logging out. Uh, request error, I don't, I didn't actually make a console.log for that because I couldn't, it's kind of difficult to make a request error. That's what happens if when you're generating the request before it actually goes across the wire, if it throws an error, it'll get caught here. Um, and then uh, the response, this is when a response comes back. And then if there's a response error, as you can see, I'm just console logging them out to the screen. Just push them in my interceptor array. And that's basically how those interceptors work. Also, uh, my HTTP error down here, this is just a button that it requests, is, it requests a value that's not there, so I'll get a 404 back. As you can see, I was able to um, catch that error and log it out. The one cool thing, too, here is you'll notice in all of these, I'm returning a promise. So what you can do is if you get a response error, you can actually catch that, handle it, return another promise, and try again. So um, is there any questions about that? I know I blew through it kind of fast. Mr. Well, I just wrote this exact same code this morning to handle session timeouts. Yeah. So this is where you would kind of, yeah. yeah. This, uh, what I ended up doing with it um, not too long ago is I handle response errors because I was noticing, and I don't know if it's just a web API thing or what, but uh, if you make a call to a web API and it throws an error, uh, sometimes you don't, what you get back is a response that has a data property on it that has the error in it. You actually don't get a, uh, whereas if you throw a 404 or an unavailable or something like that, you just have a status on the, uh, on the object. So I wrote something in response error that would actually catch all my responses, figure out do they have an error on them, do they have a status code, blah, 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 whatever. That way I'm handling all my response errors in the same way. Um, it's kind of cool. You can do a lot of stuff with it. I, I thought it was pretty useful uh, for me. And then, um, so if there's not any questions on that, I'll go on to decorators. Okay. Decorators, I didn't even know these existed uh, until a couple weeks ago uh, when I was doing global error handling is where I found them. But then I realized Angular has a decorator pattern that you can use for anything. You can use it for a directive, you can use it for a controller, a service, anything. Uh, everything I've read, I found some articles on it online and they say it's undocumented, but you go, it's in the Angular documentation, so I don't know why they're saying this, but... That's beside the point. <laughs> so, if you'll notice, I'll just do a little demo here. If you see when I say JavaScript error, it throws the error as usual, but I just logged, I intercepted the error. So, any JavaScript error I get, I'm actually just intercepting it here uh, with a global error handler. And I'm doing that with a decorator. The way a decorator works, um, okay, is with this provide. Um, during config time, you just inject provide, say provide.decorator, 
and then the name of whatever service it is that you want to uh, decorate. Like I say, it can be a controller, it can be a directive, third party, doesn't matter. And um, in your function that you pass in, it gives you this delegate. And what that delegate is, is actually a instance of the service. So, uh, like in this case, I'm, it passes it in, I'm catching the error, I'm logging it out, and then I just pass it right back to the delegate. But you can do anything. You can take that delegate and you can override a function, you can override a, uh, a method on it. You can, you can not use the delegate. You can return something else altogether. If you want to completely replace the log function, you can do it. Um, I, I think it's pretty powerful. I think you can do a lot with this, especially um, the other day I was uh, working on a directive and they had it um, they had it locked down so you could only use it as a um, not an attribute a uh, element. yeah it had to be an element and I was actually able to override it using a dec decorator and tell it I want to use an attribute too and this was a third party that someone else had written um, so I think the decorator thing is pretty cool. Like yeah, I yeah. yeah. I would like to see that. Good. Uh, well, I'd show it to you, but unfortunately, it's in some work <laughs> stuff, and I'm not allowed to show it. But if anyone really wants to see it, you can it talk to me like later. But yeah. And I actually had a bit too, because I thought my boss was going to be here about how he makes me support IE8. And I wanted you all to attack him for me, but he's not here. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's really all I have. I don't know if I went over time or took enough time. I think my right. All right. Uh, that's really all I had. Does anyone have any questions or anything? You had given an example of when you've used this. Any other times that you found either of these techniques handy? Um, for the um, I've used the provide thing for a while. I've written a couple of um, actually error handler type things. Um with provide where uh, like I've, I've written loggers and um, and during the config portion of it I put whether you want to like show a toast or uh, you know things like that things I like it so I can set debug type things you know if I create a service and I want it to log some crap out when I'm debugging but I don't want it to during um, you know, runtime, I can just go into app.config, set debug to true, that type of stuff. Angular, uh, I don't know why I find their documentation so hard to digest, but uh, they have a lot of, they're doing a lot of stuff with this provider model. Uh, you can hook into almost any uh, thing they have, like even their log service has a enabled debug on it that you can set through config using the provider model. Um, just stuff like that. Anybody else done anything with, with this? I've looked around. I feel like you can use the decorator to capture the line number and using the dollar log because dollar log right now doesn't provide an accurate line number. Your logged line number will be from the Angular set. Yeah, yeah definitely. Which really irritates me. Okay. So. No, that's a good one. And you, you have to do to implement a provider if you want to make your service or factory configurable, right? There's no yeah. way to do well, that. Well, at the end of the day, you're creating one anyway, whether you want to or not. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you just, you have to use the longer, um, yeah. You have to use this provider. Like, I could actually write this. So this is in lieu of a factory or service. This, if you look, if I make, a, this is from the Angular right, source code right here. Expanding on that. Yeah, so if I say, if I say service, mm -hmm. like I could make this same thing down here, and you're putting me on the spot, no, so okay. um, service example, or you know what, I don't want a service, I actually want a factory, because um, I don't have a... Um, what's this doing? Just capturing some text. 
yeah, I could do like this dot text equals. And I'm sure there's a ton of syntax errors in there, but it doesn't matter. But those are basically doing the same thing. This and this is doing the same thing. The only difference is I have something I can set a config time here. Oh, config, yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you go back up to the top and show the factory and service code? Yep. I, a lot of times I get a question about what's the difference between factory and service. Like yes. A factory. You scroll up about two more lines, you can see the difference. Yeah. Is the, yeah. Go ahead. A factory is when you more or less you pass in an actual function a uh, service you pass in an instance of a class you pass in a class name that gets instantiated sorry it's you, you can actually do the exact same thing if I if I made this a service it would just be ah, God damn it, tell us. oh sorry I'm not sure who's using bad language up here Sample. If I took the time to actually make this a class, I guess I could. We'll just say. Oops. Really? Those are pretty much equivalent. I think the only uh, conventional w wisdom I've read is that you, really the only time you'd want to use service is if you have some sort of a existing class that you want to uh, turn into a service. Otherwise, factory just kind of works better, I guess. Can you scroll up to show the, the implementations of the different ones? Mm-hmm. And that's copied yeah. right out of Angular source code, so you so can look at it. I mean, the main difference is for service, it's going to instantiate. It's going to do a new mm -hmm. one, whatever. Exactly. Time, that service news it up. Whereas factory is just going to return whatever your function returns. Exactly. So you're going to cache it. Yeah. So, well, you know what? I guess, too, I am doing this a little wrong. Because yeah, this would actually be uh, return. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Sorry, I figured I would, uh, uh, and I got some sort of syntax error somewhere. Oops. Yeah. What am I missing now? Just a oh, yeah. Huh. It's not C sharp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess those two are equivalent now. <laughs> Yeah, I guess to me. Yeah. I mean, I taught a class in Angular last week, and the the pro, this provider service factory value that stuff is yeah difficult to grok. I think it's mm -hmm. the most difficult thing in Angular to get your mind around. Well, when I saw that thing come up on G plus, I just wrote that global error handling. Yeah. Uh, I think my mind was saying global error. Sometimes you got to listen to what I mean instead of what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody doing anything with like any kind of interesting error handling that they'd like to explain? I know that we, we didn't. We, we just, uh, we use like the um, HTT interceptor for like handling four ones yeah. and four threes redirecting. <laughs> and um, we actually use it to store um, like return URLs. Mm -hmm. So, but that's really it. Yeah, I've had to do stuff with the HTTP and um, stuff with the. Uh, Exception handler because stuff was going in there and kind of getting lost. <laughs> We've kind of used the interceptor too to lo for logging, um, for uh, basically logging errors more or less, logging back to our server. I think the question I have is just does anyone have any kind of philosophical approaches to when, I mean, it's great for logging, I can completely see that, but in the UI, if you get just a random error back from your web call, 
is everyone like handling it in place? Are they ignoring it, or are they you know setting up some sort of global UI? Yeah, I think, you know, catch I think that if you it. if you had to do that, one of the things you could do is in the exception handler, you could in inject a service that you capture that exception that just got thrown, and you could stick it on that service and expose it to all your controllers, and then those controllers could have that service available to the to the templates to say, okay, well, you know, right now we're not able to communicate with the back end or something. So you could capture every error that happened and kind of decipher it and decide, well, this is something that my controllers can need to know about or not through a service like this. Well, and, and you could override, like, how they handle it, mm -hmm. you know, with different, like, events, you know, attach, yeah, you attaching different, like, events and, you know, you functions to that service. Yeah, you broadcast yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious, has anyone like tried to use the response error to actually like handle the error and return another promise? I don't, I've never, I couldn't figure out how to, why I would do that, but. Well, you could, if you had to unwrap the rejection, you could do something with it and then package up a new one, I guess, a fake one or yeah. something like that. Or I guess if you wanted to try one? three times right. before you <laughs> fail. I don't know. I, I, I didn't know. You could, you could really try. Uh, yeah. Other than logging, I really haven't found a good use for response error. We do. Mm -hmm. We just do um, on a response. We just check the status and do different stuff based on the status. That's a pretty common one. Um, like if we get a session timeout, we can just reload the page and it forces them to log back in, and that's handled by the back end. Um, and if we get a 404, we know that something very bad has gone <laughs> wrong. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> Something's not being served. Yeah, basically. If you get a 404, it makes it kind of hard to log it back to the server, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just have to make sure you never get a 404 on what you're logging to. It might be a little hard. Anybody else have any questions or thoughts? I would like this. If it's on authentication, like 404, then yeah, you want to go back and re authenticate. I would not be see that 401. Oh, authorize a 403. Well, tell them to set their services up, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you well, ever can you break out that, that, <laughs> that weird Sweet thing you did with the directive, I'd like to see that sometime. I mean, you don't have to do it oh, now, yeah. but if you ever right. want to take five minutes and show that, I'd be interested. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have to do, do it sometime where I can yeah. connect to my server at work. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Yep. Can I take